Okay, so uh, it's uh, June 4th, 2013, and uh, this is Gio Wiederholz. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about your background, Gio. Well, I've been in the United States since 58, but the more medically relevant work started when I came to Stanford in 1965. I became the director of the Medical Computing Center, which did not exist previously, of course, setting it up, actually focusing on real-time data acquisition. But soon as people were, co were collecting data, we found out that the users of the data, the researchers, the physicians, didn't have very good means of organizing and keeping the data. So I wound up developing uh, a database system, which now would be called a column system because that's very useful for medical data and statistical analysis. Yeah. And then with that experience, wound up looking, of course, at other medical databases. I, I didn't have a PhD at the time, so when the, when the project was finished, did various things, but eventually took the opportunity to get a degree in medical information science at the University of California in San Francisco, which I got in 1976. And my thesis was on ambulatory medical record systems. As part of that, we visited as a group about 20 sites, you know, that were involved in medical, medical record systems and got a good overview of what the issues are. So, uh, so you were a professor of computer science at Stanford and you had a background in medical informatics, is that? Actually, I became a professor in computer science only after I got my PhD. I, I was previously, as I was saying, a director of the medical computing and a lecturer. So I would I give lectures and in fact, because text is such an important part of medical data. I had an experimental course that talked about the fundamentals of textual processing. But that course wasn't very successful, I must say, because we, we called the course non-numeric methods to offset it from a course on, that was standard for Stanford on numeric methods. Well, I, uh, I remember meeting you in the early days when I was working on the design of file manager and the data dictionary and looking at the, the, the data base techniques that we would use for what's now called Vista. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my re recollection was, uh, it's a little fuzzy after all these years, but I, I, I recall you being very uh, generous with your time and, and talking about the need for uh, flexible database systems. I come from an IMS background. I was a database administrator for some time and was totally frustrated with how rigid IMS was. And uh, so that was one of my design goals was to make it more flexible. But um, so you, you've, um, you wrote a book on database technology. Right. And of course that book was somewhat influenced by that. And I had access to some early papers of Ted Codd on, well, on relational syst methods, uh, I cared less in some ways about the relational implementation, but the principles where you could access data in many different ways. Yeah. I, you know, I was of course familiar with IMS by that time, and other hierarchical systems, and in fact, you know, Stanford was looking for database systems for for their own work, and in fact, in fact. I supervised the students that designed the Stanford system eventually, which was called Spires, but Spires was still a hierarchical system, yeah. you know, which provides implicit efficiency, yeah. but also limits, limits access. So, um, yeah, well with the file manager we, we were concentrating on using the metadata to drive the system so the data dictionary was an active participant and wasn't an active the fact uh, documentation tool uh, and also we were very um, uh, concerned about con context and uh, very rich linking uh, in, in individual objects rather than 
structural to a relational table, objects could link to each other much more flexibly. Um, so moving forward um, to today's world, uh, the uh, of semantic web and triple store and and uh, a webby type interaction of, of stuff. Um, you know, I, I guess the question is, um, you've been involved with Semantic Web from the early days, right? Yeah, pretty much. You know, I've, uh, I've just think, it, I mean, in some ways it became came gradually necessary because when you say Semantic Web, that's the same as having, you know, the schema and the access methods over the relational system. And in fact, even in my textbook, I talk, which is 17, 77, but was written, of course, earlier. I talk about the design of schemas and the flexibility that they impose and making them independent for the data. So in some ways, certainly at that time, the term semantic web was not being used, yeah. but the problems already existed. And even the, the solution methods were understood, you know. Yeah. Uh, Actually, a friend of mine here in San Jose was the original designer of the first paper, I think, that used the word schema, uh -huh. you know, which was, which yeah. now is a common term in the database, yeah. the database community. Well, he I, was I, at IBM. I guess the, the theme here is 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 hierarchy um, being pre Pre-imposed on the information structure versus uh, a property of the observation. Of, of well, for me, hierarchy is a property of a coherent user group. Okay. But a coherent, but the same data can be shared by many coherent user group. You know, even in a hospital, you have the administrators who should be coherent. You know, and they have an organization that leads eventually to proper billing. And then you have the physicians, and they tend to have a patient-oriented view. Right. You know, And then you have the researchers, which have a disease-oriented views. And those are all different hierarchies that eventually come together in the same objects, namely medical treatments. But they're organized quite differently, in fact, an early issue I had with people at Kaiser is since their system was designed fully by physicians, which is very desirable, but then they tried to get grants for, for supporting research, you know, that their system actually handled that issue very, very poorly. They had a hard time understanding it. The, the VA had the advantage that they didn't have to worry about billing, so, so they could have, in many ways, a more patient-oriented view, you know, for the system, which was, of course, much inspired by Mumps and Octo Burnett's work, you know, and and that hung hung together, but that didn't support research that well either. So that I remember, whether it was at Beth Israel Hospital or something, that in order to research on their MUMPS database, they would actually copy the database and reformat it periodically for research purposes just to impose a new hierarchy yeah. on the physical structure. So looking at it from today's perspective and new today's technologies, uh, what, what kind of structures would you recommend for storing this information and giving that flexibility? Well. Uh, we talked earlier about RDF, and that stores things at a very atomic level. I'm, I, but it may be that for efficiency, you may have to group it into larger units, maybe even temporarily, etc. Now, you know, some systems do some pre-processing, including that's what Octa Burnett did over months data that be before a physician saw the patient, some processing would take place that, that would group things into more efficient structure. Yeah. You know, because, of course, computers are getting faster and faster, but disk access is still not, you know, as fast as it could be, and our data may be increasing faster 
than the speeds of disk access and you know storage capacity. So I'm not ready to give a recipe for what is universally the best storage structure. Yeah. But if you have a good schema, sure you should be able to do transformations. And the questions: At what level do you do the transformations? When do you do the transformations? Yeah. You know, we've learned a lot about caching and look ahead. So I think there's a lot of options available. Well, it, what Octa was doing about pre-processing, could that be done as a, a cache operation today? I mean, is it, just, is it really just caching that you're talking about? In some ways it's caching, but the question there, the pre-operation was done, you know, based on the schedule of the patients that were to be seen. So yeah. it could be done a day ahead. Now, probably similar processing could be done when the patient checks into a clinic. Yeah. You know, okay. uh, but, but you don't want to, even with our fast computers, waiting for everything until the patient is face to face with a physician and the, and the physician stares both at the screen and the patient at that point, you want minimal delays and a very smooth and task-oriented interface. Yeah. The, um, well, this gets into um, a, a paper you wrote about mediators uh, back in the yeah. 90s, I guess. Yeah. Would you describe your mediator concept a bit? Well, a, a mediator is an intermediate processing service that essentially takes atomic data selectively and puts it in, into hierarchy, you know, dynamically for specific users. And I give such an example. Now, the mediator also, of course, provides an interface between the logic and the physical storage. So there have been many implementations of mediators that just provide one hierarchy, an intermediary, and then go to the different formats, you know, the textual formats and all the other, which is also called middleware. So I, the mediator really should live on top of middleware, but yeah. everything that I've seen doesn't quite exist yet. Now, Ida Sim now at UCSF is trying also to, you know, have information systems that are more responsive. To, to physician needs. Yeah. Um, it also brings up the issue of hierarchy and uh, vocabulary and terminology and ontologies and everything. Um, well, well, again, a group that is coherent will develop a certain hierarchy and label things so far down in the hierarchy as is necessary for them. You know, but you know, probably the administrative hierarchy will not need terms to, to the level of, sp you know, specific genomic diseases because they don't involve billing. Yeah. On the other hand, the researcher may, may want to go very deeply down into the kind of data that we can now obtain and expect to obtain even more of that, you know, you know that are genome specific. The physicians probably somewhere in between because they would be limited in their interest to the information that can be effectively used for patient treatment. And there's much in our genomic knowledge that is, you know, way beyond being useful for treatment these days. Yeah. Although, of course, people hope that it will rise to that level. So you, you say uh, in a coherent group, uh, describe what makes a group coherent and give me an example of one. Well, I gave some examples, but for instance, I would consider internist in a certain clinic. You know, I, I've dealt with much of the, with the immunology clinic at Stanford to, to be quite coherent. On the other hand, if they interact with surgeons, Surgeons so have a very different view, you know. Surgeons start essentially from body parts, <laughs> you know, and that's where their hierarchies, okay, that's the center point of their hierarchy, 
then it goes up and down, you know, to what they can do with it. Because, you know, immunology, you know, talks about metabolic interactions, okay. which, you know, so you can recognize typically a coherent group that they use a lot of abbreviations, yeah. which if the other group then listens to them, you know, considers them, oh, they're using, you know, too many in terms. They should change their vocabulary so that yeah. we could understand it, which, which is very inefficient for the other group. The reason they use abbreviations because a frequent but lengthy term is inefficient to use. Yeah. And Zipf's law tells us already, you know, that people will use minimal length terms yeah. in order to communicate. Sure. Well, it, you mentioned immunology. Uh, Nels Journey, I think his name, he got the Nobel Prize in Immunology for uh, the immune system as a generative grammar or something like that. A uh, very Chomsky-driven thing, and this is in the late 80s. But the immune system is this incredible information processing system that's capable of detecting new antigens and you can synthesize a new antigen that's never been seen before in the world and the, the immune system will, will understand it and react to it. Yeah. And so it, it has this incredible repertoire of, of information and through a generative grammar type approach rather than a finite state grammar of this thing is this thing. Yeah. And uh, the question is, uh, should we be looking at more of a generative grammar approach to vocabulary than... Uh, but, but the generative grammar would be Im immunology specific. Now it would interact in the end because, uh, you know, the function of it of antigens is being understood through through genomics, but that is a very 3D spatial oriented thing with an antigen. Yeah. You you know connects with a proper cellular substructure. Yeah. Right, and so the the people that work at that level have again. A different view, and you don't want to impose immunologist grammar on well, well on them because yeah. you know it's not quite meaningless, but it's too much. I mean, it's hard enough to understand, you know, the three D models of genomics, yeah. and and already having insights into that is such an intellectual achievement. You don't want to load anything else up on them. So what? How do you do that? How do you get a uh immunologist talking to a surgeon talking to a, a, a genomics only only at a higher level where the abstractions start to interact and match but I think you know to uh, t I, I cannot expect that a surgeon will ever talk at a very deep level yeah. to, to an immunologist and so at that point even though some atomic information may be shared among them, yeah. you know, they would only be shared at higher level of abstractions, and very high level of abstractions, what? and loading up a requirement that the immunologist should know all about surgeon, that the surgeon should know about all about immunology is absolutely futile. And of course, that's what some people try to b d b develop universal a semantic system. I'm I'm thinking of the guy in Doug Leonard, right? Who you know who's who's was building huge genomics make nets, you know, largely for DARPA of course at the time, you know, but he believed that he could have a have a universal semantic web that would cover everything. And oh, I uh, and and so not, oh yeah in Texas psych psych corp, psych corp right yeah, yeah. and so he hired many people but it's an unscalable situation so um, so what are the prospects for a universal health exchange language do you think I mean uh, does it have to be done at a, a very high level of abstraction and generality uh, yeah actually you. Yeah, but first you have to, again, the universality is an objective. And maybe you have a separate hierarchy just for, just for that purpose. Yeah. You know, but expecting that it can describe things adequately at the lower and lower cellular and subcellular levels. Yeah. 
you know, I think is, you know, it's, well, well, it's futile. So, and, and if you can put that knowledge into a mediator that it automatically extracts information and brings it to a meaningful level, then we have, then we have coherent data interchange at a high data level you, you, you know, without requiring that everybody speaks, you know, the same vocabulary. Yeah. Interesting. The, um, well, I mean, we seem to be able to get along using English at some level. I mean, just two people talking in a, in a dialogue format. And, and if I don't understand your term, we refine it and we go on. Yeah. Um, but, but I will... I will refine the term, not necessarily if I'm a specialist, in the terms that I would use with my peers, but I would probably use baby explanatory terms. You know, in fact, that's, that's, my, that's my role as a teacher, to bring things to a level of abstraction. Yeah. You, you know, that can be understood. And here we have the problem in some ways that you know, in my current work, where I talk about intangibles, you know, we always grab back to making models based on tangibles. Yeah. But at the same time, we have to explain that these tangible models cannot be extrapolated because they get extrapolated in a different direction, you know, for, for real objects than they would be extrapolated for the intangible value that is associated with them. Maybe that's a bit abstract what I'm saying, but... Yeah. Well, I think it has to do with this um, um, notion of repertoire. What, what can you talk about? Uh, of what, what is your... the universe of discourse within a given language, so... Yeah. And, and if you talk with people that are far out of your domain, you yeah. kind of simplify it, you know, and, and for, you know... In Berlin, my current work, dollars are the <laughs> end result because everybody understands money. Yeah. You know, but the objective of money or the generation of money yeah. and what it does differ greatly among different sub sub disciplines. Sure. Well, um, and well, in health itself, you know, being healthy. You know, not being healthy, etc., has already a very different meaning in a social context than in a medical context. Well, it, 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 it absolutely. Plus the placebo or mind-body effect of of things. So there's so many entanglements here. Um, but again, it's a cross-disciplinary thing. So, for example, DSM-5 has a a term for depression. Well, maybe the immunologists have a, a, a related thing that their immune system contributes to depression somehow, and perhaps physical activities relate to it for your pedometer yeah. scores. But we don't have a way of, of, of linking together these cascading effects. Well, well but you, it's not linking them horizontally. I want to link them together at a hierarchy where they finally come together at a level of depression. and. You know, and the psychoanalyst will have input into depression based on behavioral observations, yeah. and the and the immunologist may have input, you know, to depression based on on physiological findings. Yeah. You have to bring them together, and they won't perfectly match. Yeah. You know, but it's the best best we can do. But I, again, I can't expect the 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 psychologist, you know, you, you know, to you know, to deal with all the Im immune reactions that are possible, and or, and at the same time with with, with uh, and those if affect neurological patterns. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the question becomes um, the language that we use to to break things into hierarchy. I'm getting to the dwarf yeah. here hypothesis here, but. If we have a language for psychiatry here and endocrinology here and immunology here, 
uh, we're not going to be able to talk about the, the, the interaction between these three, except no. in very specialized instances. No, not, I wouldn't call them specialized instances. At, at higher level of abstractions. Now those would be, be specialized and they wouldn't match a hundred percent, but you do your best. Yeah. You know, you do your level best to match them, okay? And it won't be a perfect match. Yeah. And, but, but, uh, but insisting on matches at lower level of detail than, than can be cognizant yeah. by your peer, by the by, by your, uh, by the people that you deal with, you know, maybe you can go one level deeper, but then there's another level and another level and another level. Yeah. You know. So the 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 language would have to be extensible into other domains, if you will. Uh, the, um, so that the a universal language would be uh, a kind of a collection of domain specific languages. Yeah. Actually, you see, I wouldn't even use the word universal language. Oh, okay. You know, I, so I think for a specific conversation between an immunologist and a psychotherapist, there, there, there would be, be a joint subset, you know, if they're talking about a certain disease, you know, that could be substantiated by both hierarchies. Yeah. But I, but I think it would be a pretense to call that a universal language because universal means that everybody should speak it yeah. and and the patient probably isn't able to speak the, speak at that level and the billing clerk even less yeah so I, I maybe call it sense making uh, apparatus or something like that yeah uh, well uh, and you know and I think as we get smart we can put a lot of that you know into the mediators that I foresee you know so the mediators would be run by a specialized discipline, you know, but within a hierarchy you have to have the coherence and if you push it too far, too broad out, then you get incoherence and actually you lose the benefits of, of language, namely the benefits of language that you have a term that, that refers to a predictable set of physical objects, of physical phenomena as understood by that group. Okay, um, I, I would <laughs> extend that into preventative issues. Uh, we invested hundreds of millions of dollars in vaccines for the latest swine flu epidemic, and it didn't. We didn't really have it. So, did we waste the money? Uh, you know, we 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 spent money to stop something, and it didn't happen. But how do you know about the value of of not having something happen. Well, that's about that's the whole question, of, you know, of you know of of insurance, right? right. You know, and, and and so if you have insurance, you, you you have to deal with risk, and risk is hard to quantify, but you have to quantify it. Yeah. And for instance, you know, and this is actually that's a problem with health insurance. There are you know, we have health insurance for very low frequency, high cost, so essentially low risk but high cost things. Yeah. But people also want to have health insurance for very, very, very predictable events. And, and throwing them all in the same analytic bucket is also an economic mistake. So, um, the VA has 30 years of data in a, um, a linked data format, the file manager. It's all controlled by a metadata dictionary. And uh, over about 10 million patients. And uh, some of it's pretty messy relationships. A lot of it's just free text. What, what's the prospect for future uh, machine learning techniques against that database. What's the value of that historical data, even though it's not categorized? Well, again, if you analyze it, you have to include the context. So I don't think there would be a universal analytic model. You know, yeah. there might be the same technology, but again, you have to retrieve. And maybe the metadata is good enough, but you you can probably validate 
the use of the metadata in a context with the examples you have from the database. Yeah. But I would do it nearly side by side, you know, so that you have have co you know, that, that you have co coherency. We we had that issue very early in a database we did at Stanford that used that column database. We had data from Stanford, of course, but we also had public record data on immunology patients that were seen in Saskatchewan. But we couldn't just mix the data together. We, we had then data from Saskatchewan yeah. that were public health, but it turns out that the observations, you know, I can't say very simply, somebody being seriously ill yeah. at Stanford would match observations of somebody being moderately ill. You know, we you know we, we use the one to five scale that's common in medicine. You know, and and so we had to process the data yeah. to bring it together with different transformation formulas, you know, based on essential patient samples because these groups when they were even though we were in the same field. Yeah. You know, we, you know, we're not coherent in terms of their expectations, and and expectations, you know, we are what gives people the reason to say this is serious, this is not serious, yeah. etc. And and a lot of qualitative observations are that way. Yeah. So I think the data could be very useful, and in some ways. I would consider the VA data more useful than some of the data that has been, you know, been collected for billing purposes because that is certainly very badly distorted. Yeah. And I've seen examples where data was collected for governmental record purposes for receiving funding from children and women's, you know, health things, which was completely useless. Maybe because everybody knew what boxes to take off in order to get the money. Yeah. And that's what they ticked off and had nothing whatsoever to do with the health status of the patients. I, I think Italy uh, announced some legislation that women with problem pregnancies would be able to have six months uh, paid vacation and right. the prevalence of problem pregnancies soared to 100%. You know, of course. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, well, so, so on the whole billing related data, which we rely on to an ever greater extent because billing has become such an important issue, yeah. it's very suspect. And the VA has, is, has a great reservoir, although it's also biased, of course, but in other ways. Yeah. Well, the, it, well, it brings up back to the issue of um, categorized versus uh, contextual data, I guess, and if you look at Google, um, it doesn't use a Dewey Decimal System to categorize the data. It just takes what's there and interprets your request, and it's this continuously updated thing. So if you put Google at one end of the spectrum and librarians doing card cataloging with Dewey Decimal System at the other end, um, I, I kind of think of healthcare as being more the librarians doing Dewey Decimal Systems today. Currently, yeah. And the the real need is to go to a, a, a Google type structure. So, what are your comments on? Well, well, the problem is that Google depends on words. Okay. And for instance, I've discussed this people who did the medical record system in Leiden. They decided to only collect words, right? Because in the future we'd be able to analyze the words. Unfortunately, our words change over time. You know, and even with the Leiden Medical School. Even if you assume that people use the words consistently, which may already not be true for, for all the disciplines, the meaning of words changes, changes over time. You know, you, you know, you know, we have more cases of, we differentiate diabetes much better than we used to. We differentiate a lot of diseases much better than we used to. So the words of 10 years ago cannot be simply matched to the words of today. And in fact, my biggest frustration with Google is that they don't always identify in the documents that you retrieve the year when it was collected. 
and so often you get mismatches and then a large part of what I teach in my course on business on the internet includes writing for the web and and the rule is since things st stay forever a date everything never use the word currently now recently or something like that in fact I'm I am also an editor in Wikipedia and I just made some corrections where people were using the word recently because I actually had to know when it happened so I had to go back to the source documents and then I you know, you know collected that Wikipedia entry but in general nobody who writes for an encyclopedia should ever use you know a, you know, a value that changes yeah. over time. Well I think linguistically that's the distinction between synchronic and diachronic language and synchronic is the language that any given time where you're the editor of New York Times uses to edit the Times. Diachronic is the flow of the language over time. And medical nomenclature is a diachronic phenomenon. Um, and But we seem to have this synchronic approach. Now, you know, next October everybody's going to be using ICD-X, whatever, and we synchronize the whole world until the next synchronization. Well, of, of course, it's not going to happen all, all at the same instance because many physicians will still use the old terms yeah. Well, and mis misuse and mismanage things, but but maybe that can be dealt with. So I think processing a large volume of historic data yeah. will have to deal with these differences. Sure. And that makes mediation again if even harder. Now yeah. I'm not saying that it's impossible. Yeah. So you were um, you were around in the early days of Google's formation. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, hey, you know, you know, you know, there were, were some pretty sm smart kids. I must say, I was not directly involved. I mentioned earlier because of the conflict of interest, because I was had been working at DARPA, which which funded the grant that eventually the Stanford students used, you know, you know to develop Google. But essentially, the the success of Google is a that they didn't make the mistake of Yahoo, that they tried to impose a hierarchy, that they had a very simple human interface for which we should credit, you know, Terry Winograd and the people around him who, who worked, of course, with them, and that they learned to use the wisdom of the masses. You know, so rather than imposing a hierarchy, they looked at the linkages that people put in Un well, well, unknowingly, you know, at what was important and what was less important, and through this iterative page ranking al algorithm, ex extract that information. So in many cases, they they're selling us, you know, what we produce for them, you know. But you call it the network effect, you know. But it's where where people benefit from other people's. You know, people's work, that if I write an HTML page or my students now write web pages, they put references in to the sources and we assume that the sources that they use are important, so they will increase in weight next time Google does, does an update of its ranking uh, yeah. values. So whatever uh, machine learning techniques does Google use to make it exploit the value of the masses or the wisdom of the masses? I mean it uses some very specific case you know to to identify scams of course yeah you know because scams have certain properties you know yeah. you know and so that is something to exploit. Yeah. But basically, they they use some learning now about places. Yeah. Because people are, especially for the advertising, people are more interested in, you know, no, no, in local places than in than in remote places, and they do some very smart advertising places, which actually, you know, 
you know, no, 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 it's very surprising. You know, we, we were planning a trip to, trip to Europe, and I looked at some concert schedules, and s suddenly I get the most amazing Google ads when I don't expect them. You, you, you know, that tell me about that. You know, the schedules for the Netherlands Ballet and the Net and the yeah. Concertgebouw Orchestra and yeah. stuff like that. You know. I might point out we're sitting at the Opera Towers, uh, apparently due to your interest in music being a good Italian. Well, well, when when I retired from Stanford, I decided to move from the suburbs to right in the middle of town, okay. walking distance to the Opera, the Symphony, also the good public library here. Yeah. Um, uh, and furthermore, yeah, this is a. Uh, uh, not quite related to what we're saying. I consider living in the city healthier than living in the suburbs because you wound up walking everywhere. We walk to the stores, you, you know, we walk to restaurants. In the suburbs you always hop into a car. Interesting. Uh, the, so Google has figured out uh, in within its search domain how to learn from people's queries and if you search for Columbus and you click on item number three in the Columbus search, the relevance of that thing. Well, the fact that it's item number three is already an indication that that item of Columbus was referenced m more frequently by important other sources yeah. than the fourth item or the fifth item. But your, your, your clicking on it also feeds back to their learning. Algorithm, no. I mean, your 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 usage. No, no, no. I, I, I certainly initially did not. Okay. You know, I but I cannot speak for what it is. Yeah. If you actually use it in some way. Yeah. The fact that I don't think the fact that you clicked on it that that only drives the advertising model. Yeah. If you actually click on it and then buy something, then yeah. it will probably feed on it. Now, I don't know what yeah. of Columbus you would buy. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I, I guess we're just kind of speculating. Nobody really is uh, talking about the secret sauce of Google. So, but you said they... No, I mean, actually, it's pretty understandable, but they have, you know, you, you, you know, by now, they exploit everything that they can. So there's not a single secret sauce yeah. anymore. And of course, Google's secret sauce in the meantime is well enough understood that Bing and Yahoo and everybody else uses uses it too. Yeah. Probably probably slightly different implementations. Yeah. You know. But you know, they now also use the wisdom of the masses because, you know, Yahoo was not scalable and I don't think Yahoo has increased the number of ontologists they use on their staff, you know, proportionally to the size of the web. Otherwise... So what you're saying is that Yahoo at one time tried to maintain a hierarchy of all the websites by the ontology editors yeah. that uh, wasn't scalable. There's just too many websites to, to do that. Yeah. And it wasn't really that useful to be forced to using that editor's assumption that this is a recreation site or whatever. Well, when the very early when I started teaching my class business on the internet, I used to have a list of interesting websites, <laughs> right? That, that were useful for my students. Yeah. You know, you know. But you know, yeah. such a such a thing you you know would be foolish. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I maintain the historical displays at Stanford, and one of the things that I show is a 1985 book. Per, produced by the Defense Communication Agency that lists everybody who had an ARPANET address with telephone number, title, etc. Et you know, and uh, you know, and I, I, I'm in it and my secretary is in it, you, you know, but obviously that was the last year they could publish it. Yeah, yeah. The, um, well, I think the, the other issue, if I were to talk about Google, I would say that it's a, uh, it's a scalability exercise. When I heard uh, Sergey Brin talk in o, 01 or 02, I, every other word was scalability in his yeah. vocabulary. And so the whole issue is how do you scale this up and how do you develop a... 
Now, Sergei Brin uses the wisdom of the masses. Okay? When I talk about coherent groups, I want to use just the wisdom of the coherent group. You know, that's a much smaller set, right? Okay. Uh, but that's what you need if you want to have precision. You see, Google doesn't try for domain-specific precision. So what would, how could you use technology to create scalable, coherent groups by domain? Well, let's say if I have all the email messages and everything that's written in a narrow domain, yeah. I could probably extract a vocabulary, you know. Interesting. And I'd have to think about how to extract a rebellion coherent hierarchy. But to certain things, that's what Psych Corp did. Whenever Psych got a contract from DARPA, yeah. they said they were doing it for the general purpose which would take care of everything. But you know, you know, but in practice they they quickly selected as a high level subset and then populated lower level in order to satisfy the need of the DARPA contract and DARPA went away very happily because the contract was fulfilled but it really had had the general effect the general scientific effect that would be hoped for. So you're talking about CYC Corp by Doug Lanot? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And you know, you know and, well, and in many ways, you know, they had insights and did things very well, but they were, were fooled by, you know, by scalability. And they didn't have, of course, a broad input that you would get, to, you know, today from the web harvesting that, that the modern search companies do. Well, what about uh, lessons learned from Google's machine learning uh, applied to healthcare? We talked previously about different domains having different hierarchies. If you do have a success story of an immunologist talking to a surgeon about a topic, of capturing that and then building kind of a wormhole between these two domains or something based on this successful traverse, if you will. Yeah, yeah, but then you'd need to get from the Im immunologist or from the immunologist domain yeah. of his peers all the subsidiary atomic elements and the hierarchy that led to the point where the wormhole existed and you would have to do the same thing from the psychologist because in the end you want to have a structure that you can base decisions on you know this wormhole provides one decision yeah. you know but you want to generalize it and grow it just like Google grows it every time you do something well but at least you have one touch point that the surgeon has talked to the immunologist and have had a, a success there. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but I also would want for, but in the end you want to relate it to a patient. Okay. So the fact that they t can share a concept which overlaps reasonably, yeah. reasonably in a situation like that being more than 50%. Yeah. Right? It would never overlap perfectly. But now you want to relate it to a patient, right? And now you have to get the patient findings, which are the immunological measurements yeah. that support the 100% of which 50% is shared, yeah. which would be through multiple levels of a clinical hierarchy. Yeah. And you would have to do the same thing from the observations you know, that's a psychology notices, yeah. you know, over patient. If it's the same patient, you know, then you get a match. If you get multiple patients, you, you, might, get some, you might get more confidence, yeah. you know, how much confidence you need from the data. Well, yeah. you see the confidence being uh, a property of the category, kind of a fuzzy set theory, a uh, certainty factor per categorization or something like that? Without no, I, I would say it as a, I would derive it from the matching atomic instances that that essentially, you see, the hierarchies come together at the bottom of the same patient. I assume that in your wormhole the fact that the immunologist was able to talk to the psychiatrist, it's that they were talking about the same patient. So now we have instances of observation of this patient. Yeah. Right? 
by the immunologist, the same patient being seen by the psychiatrist, those data being aggregated through the immunologist hierarchy on one side, through the psychiatrist hierarchy on the other side, in order to eventually create that overlap. Yeah. And, and so, the, you, you know, the validity would be the number of patient matches that that applies to. Okay. Um. And, and for general population, that we still requires much more data than we have, or even than the VA has. But I think one could do some interesting experiments already. So, so this gets back to the issue of scale. Uh, the VA having 10 pa million patients over 30 years has a very large legacy database to machine learn against, if you will. Um, but, but again, what I'm saying is the machine learning would have to be domain specific and okay. then, then, then come together you know, so the domain-specific learning would start again from the atomic observations, you know. Yeah. Now, I don't know how, how much lab data there exists. Lots, that, lots. You, you know, that, that exists for all the, all the patients. All the how, back, how much detailed psychological data exists for the patient, build up the two hierarchy, and then match on the patients. And whether we have, eventually you start losing quite a lot soon, and so how many? Yeah, you know, good matching patients you have to, to, to you know to have credible validity in that wormhole. Yeah, that's still a question. I, I use the analogy of uh, the ancient Greeks uh, having the Roman numeral system, but they didn't have a concept of zero. Um, but so it kept them from learning algebra and calculus, even though they were very advanced mathematically. So zero was a missing nothing to them that kept them from higher levels of abstraction. So the question is, is there a missing nothing today in our informatics infrastructure that's keeping us from understanding higher levels of abstraction? That's a pretty heavy question, I realize, but... Yeah. What's the I, I haven't identified anything like that, and... But uh, my problem, what's missing is really, you know, not so much missing, but what bothers me is a certain na naivete that anybody who, you know, with some experience believes they can generalize it for everybody, you know, yeah. uh, you, you, know, you, know you know, without realizing how domain-specific yeah. things they are. The, uh well, I think just using domain specificity is is kind of a missing nothing, as opposed to yeah. the. Uh, and of course, in something like RDF, you can attach context. Yeah. Okay, uh, but now you have to attach multiple, and you can uh, in RDF you can attach multiple contexts, right, yeah. to the same element. Well, and you also have provenance, also that you can say where yeah. did this come from, and is this a Walmart clinic? Yeah. Is it a a pedometer or whatever, but you have at least a, a, a traceable history to yeah. where this fact came from. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, if you're talking about the VA data, an interesting thing would be is to 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 not only collect all the data but identify the collection with the context. Yeah, you know where where it was taken. Yeah, I'm also interested in social network analysis. Uh, James Fowler. Uh, did a book on the framing heart data study, uh, superimposing social network relationships back in the history. Every time they did a study, they asked for a, 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 a survey. They said, Tell, "Give us five people who know where you were, where you will be, and for the next thing." So then they can superimpose who knew what and who had relationship to each other. Found lots of interesting stuff there. But um, you had another concept that um, I, I wanted to pick up. Oh, yeah, you you left the healthcare field in the late 1990s uh, due to a uh, uh, perversity. Fr you want to explain that a bit? Well, in some ways, frustration, you know, and what I said is uh, Im improving a broken system with you know, with technology, only makes it more rigid. Yeah. Right, and you're taking away essentially 
the ability of clinicians to make smart decisions, you know, yeah. be because they may violate some rules. In the books that I'm coming out, which which talks about about taxes and intellectual property, I make the same comments about tax regulations. The tax regulations, if they're too fine, take away the freedom that judges have to make intelligent decisions. Because if a tax evader applies the rules correctly, they can do things that make no sense whatsoever. But since the rules cover them, it's yeah. okay. Whereas a smart judge, if they didn't have the rules, could easily decide this makes no sense whatsoever and come to a completely different decision. So as it applies to health care, we have 100,000 pages of legislation and 5 million terms for UMLS. Uh, are we over-specified in the same way, you think? I mean, it just... Likely, but since I don't want to give a simple yes or no answer because I haven't... Yeah looked at it, you know. Great. And of course, you know, what they already did is combining terms with from so many domains for the UMLS, which is, was an interesting and nearly masterful exercise. But of course, that was done really without keeping context, as far as I know. The context is certainly not visible at the higher level. Yeah. If you look at the origin, the context would remain. But since terms, to my mind, are, uh, are contextually, and also we may talk about temporally dependent. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, I, well, I would worry a bit that yeah. things are done well, and imposed in, you know, you know, you know, too simplistically. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Anything else you want to say in parting? No, I just said I don't expect that all these problems will be solved in my lifetime. <laughs> so what, what's the next opera you're going to see? Uh, yeah. Oh, the oh, yeah, oh, oh, we're going to see again the yeah. ta Tales of Hoffman right here. But what I'm really looking for is the 29th of August. We're going to see Aida in its original, uh, you know, of course, a replica of the original performance uh, in the in the amphitheater in Verona in Italy. <laughs> We've, uh, that's done for for Verdi's, I think, 100th birthday or death date. The, 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 they're repeating an opera the way it was originally staged uh -huh. and well then performed. So, so we will be in Verona for that. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gil. I appreciate your time.